just to get up front of anybody, is it? He's up there on stage. He's right. And it is. It's, I, I'm proud of these guys for doing what they've done with communion. Uh, it is, you know, difficult sometimes to get up here and, and to speak if you're not used to those type of things. We're going to be having our sermon in just a moment. Joe's going to be bringing it. It'll be a little different than what we're used to. Yeah, thank you for the, the young ladies in, in the high school and junior high that have been handing out bulletins and all the things they've been doing. Uh, but we're going to uh, just do things a little differently today, very casual. Uh, we just want to celebrate with you today. Remember, there are no classes after service, so just go home and enjoy your family time and your last-minute preparations for the Christmas holidays. Let's stand as we sing together. <clears throat> oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. Sing, choirs of angels, sing in exaltation. Oh, sing, all ye bright hosts of heaven above. Glory to God, all glory in the highest. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Yea, Lord, we greet thee, born this happy morning, Jesus, to thee be all glory Appearing. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. Be seated, please. No one knows the date of the birth of Jesus. The Bible just simply doesn't give it. Centuries ago, the Catholic Church was spreading Christianity around the world, and as they did so, sometimes had large numbers of people converting from various religions into Christianity. Often those religions were pagan religions, and to help to make the transition from what they had believed and been before into Christianity, the Catholic Church then would sometimes choose certain dates that coincided with pagan festivals and make them holy dates having to do with Christianity so that those people could move from that religion into Christianity in greater comfort, if nothing else. And so they chose the 25th of December to be the date that we would celebrate the birth of Jesus. It's likely that it probably occurred in the spring, but it's really irrelevant. The fact is that it's a date that the world over because of the influence of Christianity is chosen and celebrated that Jesus did come. Before he was here, he existed in the heavens, of course. In the Gospel of John, in chapter 1, he's referred to as the Logos. It's harder to explain or define the word Logos. It's, it's logic, but it's much bigger than that. It's word, but it's much more comprehensive. Sometimes we just call him the Son. And so the Logos would be made flesh. He decided that he would come and be one of us. And there were many, many reasons for that. You can imagine what it must have been like in heaven because not everything is explained by God to the angels or to even to humans. Sometimes when people ask questions about why did God do this or how did God do that, the answer has to be only God knows. 
If you tried to explain it all to us, we wouldn't understand. And if God could be completely understand by human beings, then he wouldn't be much of a God anyway. But can you imagine what it must have been like in heaven when Jesus decided, or when God the Father decided, that this Logos, the Son, would become one of us and take, by the way, a very common name, Joshua. That's what it would be in the Old Testament. Jesus, Jesus in the New Testament, Jesus being Hispanic version of it. It's just a very, very common name. And so as the angels would look around and say, where is the sun? Well, he's on the planet. Really, where? In that woman, because he chose to be one of us in every way, to experience everything that we experience. And so, the birth of Jesus. In America, and perhaps in other parts of the world, I'm just not as familiar, but at least in America, between Thanksgiving and Christmas time, we've made it into a holiday season that at one time had religious connotations and still does to some extent. It became then a family holiday, which I'm all for. I think that's wonderful. And finally became commercialized, where that a lot of in businesses, particularly retail businesses, can only exist based on the amount of money they make in that period of time. Well, whatever the flaws, whatever we've done with it that's not so good, there's still many things about it that are good, such as the family time. And the fact that the world does stop at least, at least this once a year. So think about the fact that there was an incarnation. That means becoming flesh. That God, the Son, would become one of us. To fulfill the prophecies, he had to be born in the city of David. The city of David was a little town called Bethlehem. And so we start our reading in the first verse of the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree, a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So, Joseph. Joseph is the man who was marrying Mary. Mary was the mother of Jesus. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie above thy deep and dreamless sleep. The silent stars go by, yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. For Christ is born of Mary and gathered all above. While mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wandering love. Oh, morning stars together proclaim the holy birth and praises sing to God the King and peace to men on earth. O oh, holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. Come to us, abide with us, our Lord, Emmanuel. 
this birth was as you would expect it to be. If the king of kings is going to be born, you would imagine it would be in the most luxurious surroundings. Not only was he not to be born in that kind of location, but everything about this birth was going to be suspect. Joseph discovered that his bride-to-be, his fiancée, was going to have a child. It was important, by the way, that she become pregnant before they actually get married because the prediction, the prophecy, was that she would be born of a virgin. Therefore, it had to be that her, the inception took place before she was married. And then when Joseph discovered that she was to have a child, of course, his mind would go where anybody's mind would go, that she has been unfaithful to me. He was told, no, this is not. This is not her being unfaithful. This, this child is being born different than any other child ever. She's a virgin who's going to have a child because the child has been placed in her by the Holy Spirit. It's important that Joseph's lineage was from David. It was even as important that Mary's lineage was from David. And so as we read again in Luke chapter 2, Joseph headed to Bethlehem. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married with him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. unconventional birth a woman who is pregnant though she's never been with a man delivering the king of kings not in a palace but in a stable because not even a guest room was available in the inn you would think that if God wanted to announce the birth of the king of kings that he would choose those of power or position or prestige to which to whom announce this the coming of the king in every society, in every culture, there are those jobs that are considered to be prestigious. This is an occupation that if you're there, that means probably you're highly educated, you're very intelligent, and you're probably going to make a lot of money. Also, in every culture, there are those jobs that are considered to be menial. The, the bluest of the blue-collar jobs, if you will, that, that society or culture would perceive the people who take those jobs as being uneducated or not particularly intelligent even though they may well be, society would view them that way. In the Old Testament, the job of a shepherd was a beautiful job. Even David had been a shepherd who later became the king. By the time of the New Testament, it was considered to be one of those menial, low-paying jobs that if you could do anything else, you did. And if you couldn't find a better job, you took care of sheep. And the lowest of those were those who had to work during the night. They were the ones who worked through the darkness, protecting the sheep from the predators, making sure that they were safe and okay. 
And if these were the people who came into town, nobody paid any attention to them. They didn't smell as good as the other people because of their occupation. They were the lowliest. They were not paid highly. They were not considered to be intelligent. It was just the job you took if you couldn't get anything else. It's interesting then that when God decided to announce the birth of the child, not only was the child not born in a palace to a princess, but to a young woman. As a matter of fact, in that culture, probably about 15 years old. To a young woman who probably was being scandalized by everybody who knew her. Oh, they're not yet married, and yet she's pregnant. You must, you must know what that means. And so they're scandalizing her. And so now she's traveling. She can't even find a room in the hotel. She's in a stable, there to deliver a child with the help of her husband and apparently no one else. And so when God decides to announce it, he doesn't go to the philosophers. He doesn't go to the universities. He doesn't go to the kings, the parliaments. He goes to these lowly shepherds. As we read in Luke chapter 2, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Wouldn't you have been? I don't know if you've ever been out from the city where there's not many lights, and it's the middle of the night, and the stars are brilliant because of the fact that they're not being diluted by the pollution of lights around you to enjoy that quietness, that solitude, and the beauty. And then suddenly, the glory of the Lord, that means everything lit up, and there, an angel, and you realize this is a supernatural being. He's not like you. I'd be terrified as well. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David. A savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. They've been looking for the Messiah for centuries. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them, by the way, once you realize that they were the angels who had come to give you good news, I don't think you'd want them to go. To listen to them praise God. I don't it says they were saying, we tend to think of praising as singing. And if they were singing, can you imagine what it must have sounded like? And finally they depart. I think I would have been saying, no, stay. I want to hear more. But when the angels had left, oh, and by the way, the shepherds would have never gone looking for a king in a palace because they could have never been allowed. And so they were told, no, 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 no. He's in a manger. If you've ever been on a farm, we probably didn't call them mangers when I grew up. We called them troughs. Just wooden slats that would hold the grain or whatever you were going to feed that you'd pour for the animals. Therefore, that trough had been eaten out of by sheep and goats and whatever other animals they had had there. If you've seen them, they tend to be kind of slick on the inside because they literally have been cleaned so many times by the tongues of those animals. And there, she would place those claws that she could find. And she would place that baby, which meant that these shepherds would be welcome. They could go to a stable, never to a palace. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off apparently forgetting the sheep and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, there was nothing, by the way, that would be spectacular about this child. 
You may see the paintings where he would have a halo about his head that would not have existed in real life. He was just a baby. You can imagine when Joseph helped Mary birth him and they knew this was the son of God that they would be expecting all kinds of things for this child to do because this is God in flesh. And, and so they birthed him and put him there and then he burps and cries and messes up his diapers. And they're thinking, this is God. He really is one of us. He has come to experience what we experience in every sense. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. The first Noel the angels did say was to certain poor shepherds in fields where they lay, in fields where they lay, keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so deep. No. nights ever we think about all the gifts that we get at Christmas time and how great they are our iPods and our iPhones and all our this and I that the greatest gift of all was a baby we see our children born those of us who've been able to be part of that process where we go in and we watch the miracle of birth and it is a miracle but you want to talk about a miracle a teenage girl, a virgin, giving birth to the Son of God. Can you imagine the feelings that that child went through, that that girl had as she was laying there in labor, knowing that she was having the Son of God? There had to be something different that night. There had to be some kind of feeling on earth that something was changing, that something great was happening. We sing 
this next song, which is probably one of the most popular Christmas songs ever, and think about how holy that night was. Whether it was Christmas time or wherever, it doesn't really matter. But a little child, a young child was giving birth to the Son of God. That's a miracle. And because of that night, because of the night that he was born to that young couple in a sticky barn, in a trough, like you said, we have eternal life. We have the chance to live with God forever. Let's sing this song together. their 33rd birthday. Jesus would live on this planet for 33 years. For 30 of those years, we know little about him other than his birth and an incident when he was just about to become a teenager. And then he starts again at 30, which is consistent with other Bible stories, where that God would call a person into a position of ministry and leadership at age 30, such as King Joseph. Or John the Baptist. The real purpose of the Advent was that Jesus would come and live as one of us to understand us. So that the Hebrew writer would say that he was tempted in all points like as we are. He knows everything we feel because he lived in one of our bodies. He knows all that we experience. He undoubtedly attended the funerals of people that he loved, uncles and aunts. Joseph, for example, somewhere disappears between Jesus being 11 and Jesus being 30. Apparently, Joseph died, which means that in all likelihood, Jesus attended the funeral 
of the man who raised him as his father. He understood life. All about life. Everything about life. And then ultimately, he fulfilled the purpose of God, which was this. Way back at the beginning, when God had made humans to begin with, we sinned, which alienated, alienated us from God because God is not sin. God is holy. And he had said that the way to reconcile, that the way that a person who had sinned, and by the way, he indicated the penalty for sin. The penalty for sin is death that that death could be then paid by someone else. Not just physical death, but a spiritual death, a separation from God. I can't pay your debt because I have to pay my own. You can't pay mine because you owe your own. So God would come, live as one of us, but live sinlessly so that, that then he vicariously could take the sins of all. So that Paul would say that when he was on the cross, he was made sin for us meaning he took every sin that anyone's ever committed, whatever that sin might be, lying, cheating, envy, lust, murder, hate, anything you can imagine was all put on Jesus at the cross so that he could pay the penalty. Therefore, he was made sin. He knew that was going to happen. He lived expecting that to happen, and he did that to fulfill the righteousness of God so that then we can put our faith in him. And God said that would be the only requirement, that if we place our faith in Jesus, then we, we have the advantage. He becomes, it's a fancy Bible word, the propitiation. He becomes the atoning sacrifice in our place. He's the one then that takes the penalty for all the bad stuff I have done. You and I had no choice as to whether we were born. Jesus did. He didn't have to come. He chose, the Logos, the Son, chose to be one of us. The Father, of course, was involved in the decision. The Spirit as well, but he chose to be born so that he could redeem, buy back, rescue, deliver, that miraculous birth sets up the possibility of another miraculous birth. His was a miracle because he was born of a virgin. Our miracle is one that's a miracle because it is spiritual. So the Bible refers to it as a new birth. So that as I had no choice to be born into this body, as I have lived in this body through my lifetime, there are times when I have done wrong. And the penalty for that, according to the Bible, is death. But what, whatever age, whether you're 15 or 55 or 85, it makes no difference. If whatever age a person decides, wait a minute, I want to be different. I don't want to be who I am as I am. I want to be forgiven and clean and holy. Then we may choose a miraculous birth just as Jesus chose a miraculous birth. And it doesn't have to happen in a cathedral just as his birth happened in a stable. So could ours. Or on a river bank, hiking through the woods, sitting in a church building, lying in a hospital room, sleeping or about to sleep in my own bed. It's a decision that doesn't have to be in some special, magnificent, holy place. It's a decision that I will have my miracle. Again, the Bible calls it the new birth. So it really makes little difference that Jesus was born as far as you're concerned, unless you choose to have your own birth, your own miracle. Many, if not most, of the people in this room have had that birth. He came when at some point in our lives we placed our faith in Jesus, not just believing that he is, but that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, Hebrews eleven six. To the point that we put our trust in him and that meant that we changed our will. It didn't mean that we became perfect in the way we think or perfect in the way we act. It didn't mean we became perfect in the eyes of God because through this act called repentance, I decided not to live as I was living. I choose not to live for God. 
And so through my belief and my penitence, and then just as did those shepherds who once they knew that good news could not keep it to themselves. They had to tell everybody what they'd experienced. Well, ours starts at the very moment of our birth. In church language, it would be called confession. So that Jesus says, you must confess me with your mouth. But it doesn't just happen at one point. It's a confession that exists as long as we live. Not just in this body, but in that next world to come. A confession that God is. That Jesus is Lord. That we surrender and submit to him. That we tell anybody and everybody of whatever opportunity we have, just as did those shepherds. And then to symbolize the birth. The Jewish people had already been practicing it. The Romans had their own version. If you were, if you were in a Roman family and for whatever reason your parents died, for example, and you were going to be adopted into a, another family, part of the Roman practice was that they actually immersed you in water. What that symbolized was you were dying to the family that you were in and that you were being born into that new family. The Jews had been practicing something very similar to that called mikvah, living water, which basically said... We'll die to ourselves, we'll die to the old, we'll be born again in you. And as a matter of fact, conservative Jewish people still do it every Friday night. And Christianity is only done once. One baptism, Ephesians 4 says, where that based on my faith, I will go through this symbolic act. Confessing my faith. Evidencing my penitence. I am buried in water, not dirt. And I rise indicating that I've started all over again. The power and the purpose of the baptism is all to do with the faith, all to do with what you're putting yourself into. If you have not submitted yourself to Jesus, if you've not given your heart and life to him, if you've not turned from sin to righteousness, if you've not been immersed in the Lord, is there a better time than now? Is there a better place than this? It doesn't have to be any place other than where you are now. And so we're going to sing in just a moment another song. And this time, if you've not yet given your heart to Jesus, we would love to experience your birth this Christmas season. Come up here. We'll help you. If you don't understand enough about it, We'll teach you. If we don't have enough time here, we'll set up a series of Bible studies with you. But what a great time to be born. It's your decision. Or if you are a Christian who just needs the prayers, no better place or time to ask than now. If we can help you, come right up here while we sing this song. Have you a heart that's weary, taking a load of care? Are you a soul? 